Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for the invitation for the talk. As usual, I think who learned most is someone who's trying to put it all together and make some sense out, out of any topic that we try to choose. So um, today I chose the topic to talk to you about uh, intentions. Actually, it's intentions and actions. And I hope I can walk you through a little bit uh, what was I thinking when I chose it and why I chose it. I have some sort of, I had some sort of a dilemma trying to understand better what's the weight of our intentions and what's the weight of our actions in everything we do. Okay, so just to talk about the definitions. These are the definitions I could find for our intentions. So you see that usually it said that intentions are a purpose, a goal, or an aim that you have. Uh, also the act or fact of intending, determination to do a speci specified thing, or act in a specified manner. So whatever your head is intending towards any action. Uh, there's also two very interesting uh, definitions that I chose to put it together with those that are for philosophy. It's the direction or orientation of the mind toward an object. And for the law, it's the result or design with which a person does or refrains from doing an act, a necessary ingredient of certain offenses. So I thought, in a way, the law definition kinds of uh, also uh, matches what we're trying to discuss. Okay, so part of my dilemma was, well, we say very often that our intentions matter. And we often discuss this in groups in here. Well, but then there is our intentions. The, the intentions are important. And I went to check on the book. Okay, let's see what the Spirit's book have to say about intentions. Where, where is it? Is it clear in there? Where they can express? What are the intentions important? So the first question I found was that is prayer pleasing to God? And then uh, the Spirit's answer: uh, Prayer is always pleasing to God when it comes from the heart. Intention is everything in God's eyes. And a prayer from the heart is preferable to one read from a book. So this is the first one. So it's talking about our direction of the heart when we make a prayer to God. Another one, not very far from the first one, is has God ever appreciated human sacrifices when offered with a sincere religious intention? This is a tricky question. So the spirits answer never, but God always considers the intention that motivates any act. So they describe a little bit uh, in what circumstances these spirits were practicing their human sacrifices. And they explain that it is related to that degree of evolution. And back then, they didn't know any better or they, or they thought they were doing the best thing, except if you take the last uh, sentence, that many among them already understood the evil they were committing intuitively, but they did it anyway for the gratification of their passions. So, of course, God takes into consideration intention, but there are uh, different perspectives. Another question is, is offering the fruits of the earth more acceptable, more acceptable in God's eyes than sacrificing animals? So first sacrificing humans and then sacrificing animals and then sacrificing fruits, maybe, <laughs> though in this order. Uh, then again, I have already answered your question by saying that God judges the intention behind an action. So it doesn't really matter if you're offering a fruit, if you're offering a human, 
but um, God always takes into consideration your intention. Of course, the act is the act, and we're going to talk about that later. So the intention is everything, while the fact is nothing, at least for uh, determining through God's eyes. And are all murders equally evil? And they answer, God is fair. God judges the intention rather than just the deed. And these are just some of the examples I found. Actually, I found several questions that would address how much our intentions matter to God. And even not only in the Spirit's book, if you go through gospel, uh, according to Spiritism, you'll find some uh, whole uh, chapter, maybe, or many parts referring to that part. So the question I have to ask you is when you know that, when you know now that, well, intentions are really, really taken into consideration. So if you reflect upon that, uh, does that make you feel relieved? Does that worry you? Okay, so going to next, things are debated inside my head. This is a proverb, so the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Also said as, hell is full of good meanings, but heaven is full of good works. So the first one is attributed to Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, however they're not sure if he actually was the first author, but it was the only book they could find, the first book signed by someone that mentioned something like this. And then I ask you, have you ever said that? Even if it's to yourself, silently? Mm. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? When you said that, try to remember last time you said that. And was it in which situation? Was it towards something you were doing or someone else was doing? So usually it's what someone else was doing. Uh oh. So I gave, I put this example here. So I don't know if you know this, but this guy is a pop culture <laughs> reference. So it's an, uh, a villain from the Avengers universe, Marvel universe. So this guy, he wants to collect all these colorful gems that you see here in his globe. And the idea is, well, the world is suffering, and the world is suffering with wars and hunger, and what's causing it is an excessive number of people. So the way I fix it and bring peace to the universe is collect all these gems, click my fingers, and make half randomly chosen people on the population just turning to dust and then everything is solved. Would it be a good example for that? <laughs> so when I thought about this situations when I myself said, well, have the road to hell is paved with good intentions, two things came to my mind. So one of them is when we think that this person had a second intention. So usually not myself, of course. I don't say that about myself. I say that about other people. So it's something that someone did that ah, was really bad and they profess, but I was full of good intentions. All I wanted is fix everything or make everything better. But then deep inside you think, hmm, Maybe, maybe what they want is to get promoted and, and work. Maybe they have a second intention in there. 
Maybe they just want to get famous or something. So I found this reference. Um, it's a Spiritist magazine, uh, but it's only in Portuguese. This is the author. And he presents all these ideas about having second intentions. And actually what he says is, everybody has second intentions. And most of the times, we are having multiple intentions at the same time. So he mentions ex as examples, a physician who studies with the intent to cure patients, but also achieve professional status or good salary. A politician who works to be elected to help society, but at the same time be praised and re-elected. And an athlete who trains to surpass marks, but also to the ecstasy of the podium, the victory and the fame. So we have to study our intentions, but study all of them. The second situation when you use that sentence, that proverb, is when someone has a good intention. It's the case of Thanos there. But they don't know what they're doing. And the consequence is really, really bad. So they're full of good intentions. So this is about our actions. And this is from Matthew, uh, it's chapter 16. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So it doesn't say according to what was their intentions. Right? Okay. So then, um, this is just one of the examples, too, that I could find in the book. But I, I'm going to mention other examples where they mention the importance of the action. So this is just a question about books that were written by some people that were very good, moral prophet. The books were very good. But then um, they could not derive much moral profit themselves with what they have written. So what uh, Kardec asks is, is the good those authors do by their writings be counted to them as spirits? And they say, well, professing these principles of morality without subsequent action is like having a seed without completing the sowing. So intentions matter, yes. It depends on how is the goals of you writing it or not. But you have to actually sow the seeds and collect. And later, they even say that these authors are even guiltier because they possess the intelligence that enables them to understand. So uh, we have to act accordingly. Then I put, this, oh, I put these options, very simplistic options in there. So there are four. One, when we have a good intention and we have a good action. Second, if we have a good intention, but we end up doing a bad action. Three, if we have a bad intention, but we end up doing a good action. The, the case of the writer of the book, well, we've done some good in there. With the wrong aim, maybe, but it was good. And four, when we have a bad intention with a bad action, yeah, I want a revenge, right? So if you look, into this four. Where are you? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So often what happens to us is that we fluctuate. We go here, we go there sometimes. Yes, we're able to, to have good intentions and do good actions. But sometimes, the next moment, we are there doing with a bad intention and doing a bad action. And we fluctuate through this in our daily lives every time we have choices to make, right? OK. Then we, want, we need to discuss that a little bit. Because then, well, OK, if we're, I'm talking to you well, it's a good intention, it's a good action, or it's a bad intention and a bad action. So what, after all, is good or bad? So there are several questions addressing that in the Spirit's book. I just maybe 
probably like if you want to go through this I would recommend this book three moral laws it's all there um, so first thing how can we distinguish between good and evil Kardec asks good complies with God's law and wickedness diverges from it very simple Therefore, to do right is to comply with God's law, and to do wrong is to violate that law. Very simple. As humans are subject to error, can they make mistakes in their judgments of good and evil? Can they believe to be doing right when in reality they are doing wrong? And then the Spirit says, Jesus said, do to others whatever you would have them do to you. That sums up everything. You will never go wrong. So if you're in doubt, that's what you need to do. Kardec also asks, well, are good and evil absolute for all humanity? Because we know we have different backgrounds and we have different cultures around. And then they answer, God's law is the same for everyone but evil resides in the people's desire for it to happen. Good is always good, and evil is always evil, regardless of what a person's position may be, independently. And the difference is only in the degree of accountability. So whenever we are debating, well, what are these actions I have to make and what's my intentions? What we are trying to choose is the less accountability as possible towards something bad or the best accountability as possible for something good. And then Kardec, in all his wisdom, asks, well, there is good and bad. Good and bad are very clear what it is. It's according to God's law and it's not according to God's law, but are there some spirits that are created good and others bad? Then they answer, God created all spirits simple and unaware. God has given them each a particular mission to enlighten them and help them gradually reach perfection through the knowledge of the truth and rise closer to him. In that perfection, they will find eternal bliss without any troubles. And, a cor uh, and Kardec uh, compares this situation and says, well, then according to what you're saying, spirits are like children when they are born. And they say, yes, it's a fair comparison. So rebellious children remain ignorant and imperfect. How much they benefit depends on their obedience. So it's the same thing for us here on earth. So we are spirits, we are created simple and unaware. At what stage we are, how much do we know? We don't really know how much do we know already. I want to talk to you about this uh, mediumistic message that I could find on, on the Spiritist Review. So it's a case called the King Kampois Street. Just to show you an example of, of this uh, battling of intention and action. So this happened um, at the beginning of the Italian war and the, it was the head of a family, a man, that enjoyed the sympathy of all neighborhood and had a son who was drafted to war. Since his position did not allow him to avoid his son military service, he then had the idea of killing himself so that his son would be exempted as the only son of a widow. So he would prevent him from going into war. And they talk a little bit, they ask for the mental spirits to allow them to talk to the spirit. And I'm gonna show just three questions that they made. You say that you suffer. There is no doubt that you made a mistake by committing suicide, but has the reason that led you to that granted you any indulgence? And he answers, my punishment will be shorter, but the action is not less serious. 
The uh, next question, he said, well, could you describe the punishment that you endure, giving us the maximum amount of details to our instruction? And he says, I suffer twice as much in the soul and in the body. Although I have no more body, I suffer like the empty with the absent member. And was the only cause of your action the salvation of your son, or were you driven by another cause? I was guided by paternal love only, but it was a bad guide. That is why my penalty will be abbreviated. So they talk to the spirit. Uh, there are many, uh, it's a, a longer story than that. And uh, the spirit has trouble writing the word God. And they try the most to make him feel enough trust to be able to write God. And the observation that the spirits make after this talk to the, the actual spirit is that what's interesting. So they say that, well, through the, through the action, they may have impeded the accomplishment of his son's destiny. To begin with, it is not certain that he would die in the war and perhaps that career would have given him an opportunity to do something useful to his progress. Undoubtedly, such a consideration shall not be alien to the severity of his punishment. His intention was certainly good and that was taken into account in his case. The intention attenuates the fault and deserves indulgence, but it does not hinder the bad from being bad. If it were not for that, one could excuse every wrongdoing and even kill under the pretext, pretext of good intention. Could one believe, for example, that we can kill a hopeless man in order to abbreviate his sufferings? No, because that action would abbreviate the trial that he has to undergo and we do more harm than good. Is the mother who kill her child in hopes that the child will go to heaven less culpable because she did so out of a good intention? Based on such a system, we would justify every crime that was committed by blind fanaticists in the religions, religions war. So they explain, and again they say, well, good is good and bad is bad. The intentions, they matter into the degree of accountability that the spirit is suffering. Okay. Uh, and this is the question that we have in the spirit's book. Is suicide excusable when committed to avoid bringing disgrace to one's children or family? And they say, well, people who act under disbelief do no good, but they think they do and God takes their intention into consideration. Intention lessens the fault, but it is a fault nevertheless. So I want to go back to that sentence or that this proverb. So the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'm going back to that one because we need to reassess, if you were here in the studies group, it's not been a long time ago that we studied that. But, or if you don't know, what is hell to spiritism? We have to remember that. So now when you say that again, <laughs> you may have an, a different interpretation of what you're saying. So what is hell? So Kardec asks, are there specific places in the universe set apart for the joys and sorrows of spirits according to their merit? So that's traditional hell, a place where everybody who's suffering would go and stay there. And then he says, well, we have already answered this question. The joys and sorrows of spirits are inherent to their degree of perfection. Each spirit finds the principle of its happiness or unhappiness within itself. So it's something that we live through, incarnated or disincarnated. Uh, and he continues. Does this mean that heaven and hell, as people have imagined them, do not exist? They're only symbols. There are happy and unhappy spirits everywhere. So that's what we're talking about, hell. 
So what should we do now that we have all this information? And uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, what is the most effective method for guaranteeing self-improvement and resisting the attraction of wrongdoing, Kardec asks. And then it's St. Augustine that answers that, and it's a long answer, but I'm going to ask your forgiveness because I'm going to show his full answer. It's going to be tough. Um, so first he starts very simple. A philosopher of antiquity once said, know thyself. And then I brought Alice there. So I remember this part of um, the adventures of Alice in Wonderland. I don't know if you are familiar with, but I believe you are. So what happens to Alice is that at some point she is lost in Neverland and she's lost in this forest and she meets the cat, the Cheshire cat. And then she asks, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat answers, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. And then Alice adds, so long as I get somewhere. Oh, said the cat, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. So I like this part because it, it's very similar to what we're going through. And actually, if you, if, even if you don't worry too much about thinking about your intentions or your actions, we know we're gonna get there. You just have to walk long enough in this world. Then comes the next part that's even more interesting. Then Alice said, once she figures out a little bit of what she wants, <laughs> she says, but I don't want to go among mad people. And I'm like, yeah, Alice, I know. I know the feeling. <laughs> I know what you mean. And then the cat says, uh, you can help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. And she said, how do you know I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. So the way, a good way to start your knowing thyself is remember you were here <laughs> and why you were here and what that means according to spiritism. So first thing I tell you, if you thought you were the number one good intentions, good actions all of the time, you're wrong. Or, well, maybe you have a mission and you're wasting your time here. <coughs> and then Kardec says, well, know thyself. Okay, we fully admit the wisdom of this thing. But self-knowledge is precisely what is most difficult to achieve. How can we acquire it? So it's not just me or you who find that extremely hard to do that know thyself thing. So then St. Augustine poses a lot of things, but he kind of gives a recipe. It's what we all want, yay, a recipe. He says, well, ask yourself these questions. Are you taking note? What you have done? What was your aim? Way, intentions and actions right away. Whether you have done anything that you would find fault for in another, or whether you have done anything that you would be ashamed to admit. Also ask yourself, if God called me into the spirit life at this moment in time, where nothing is hidden, would I dread seeing anyone? Review what you may have done, first, against God, second, against your neighbor, and lastly, against yourself. Easy peasy. So he recommends we do this every night. I'm <laughs> done. 
I'm done. He doesn't stop. Wait, there's more. <laughs> he doesn't stop there. So he could foresee what's going through uh, Kardec's mind maybe in this session. And he said, well, you're going to ask, you may ask, how does one judge oneself? Self-knowledge is key to improvement. And aren't all human beings subject to the illusions of arrogance? which diminishes their flaws in their own eyes and make it possible to find excuses for them. Misers think that they are merely practicing economy and foresight, while proud individuals think their pride is dignity. This is true, but there is a way of proceeding that cannot deceive you. When you are in doubt regarding any of your actions, Ask yourself what your judgment would be if it were done by another. If someone else was doing, remember that situation when you said, hell is full of good intentions. Yeah, are you doing the same thing? Were you there doing, well, full of good intentions maybe, but uh, the results were not what you were expecting? And then, to aggravate a little bit, he says, try to discover what others think and do not overlook the opinion of your enemies. Ouch. That hurts. Can we stop a little bit before that? Those who are firmly resolved in achieving self-improvement must reveal their conscience in order to uproot their evil inclinations. So we have to revisit all the time take all the weeds from their gardens. Every night they should settle their moral accounts for the day just as businessmen account for their profits and loses, losses. They can rest assured that the former will be much more profitable operation than, than the later. Okay, so, um, the sum of Everything that I wanted to transmit to you is that first thing, don't oversimplify your intentions. Don't focus on the first one that you think it's the prettier. Because usually is what we do is exactly the thing that he mentions you. Well, I am just practicing economy. You know, you have to study all your intentions and you have we have to get away from good and bad we have to know more objectively what is the intention I want the job because it pays more and I'm gonna get a comfortable life maybe I can help others <laughs> and then you can shift that and say well I want this salary because I want to help others is it Right? As best as we could, we should split those, in, those intentions. What is really happening? Because when it comes to selfishness and pride, we tend to hide it very well. And we trick our minds into doing this. So we have to observe that. And of course, actions, just look at the consequence of what you do. And if you ever, I think, maybe I did, but if, you, if you've ever been to that situation of a good intention and a good action, you feel it. You feel it within yourself. You know you did the right thing. You see it, you feel it instantaneously. It's, it's a joy that you cannot contain, right? So you, there's also in the book somewhere else that I decided not to put here that when you find that, when you actually do and you find out that you did a good thing with a good intention, you have to recognize that. It's not the time to be humble. It's not the time to, oh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not just another. No, you have to do that. It's how you learn. You learn from the good experience and you learn from the bad. We don't, don't just learn from the bad experience. So whenever you do a good thing, you have to recognize it and take note. What was it that was so good about it? And then keep doing it. Right? Okay.
Well, that was my talk for the night. Thank you.